Our aim today is to inspire, provoke thought and help people to reflect theologically on the task of communi communicating the gospel in the 21st century. So if this day is successful, by the end of it, you'll be thinking, could I do this another way? What am I happy about the way I am doing it? Could I branch out? Is there, a, is there other creative ideas I could try something new? And you'll be hopefully theologically engaged, and that will be brilliant. If not, well, you're going to just have to chase me down the bailey with pitchforks. I hope it'll be successful, and I'm confident in the team that we've got. And um, it falls to me to begin the day. But let's just park all that and pause and pray together. Spirit of God, we ask you to join us this day. To weave your creative power into hearts and minds. To lift our vision, to think of new possibilities, new ways in which we might communicate your love in this age. So would you be the teacher in the room this day? challenge, convict, comfort and inspire, we pray. Amen. So, back to the beginning. Preaching. What is it? What are we doing when we talk about it? Well, let me offer you this definition of preaching. Um, it is on your handout. I've tried to give you a fairly full handout. Um, I think that preaching is defi defined as the design and delivery of an oral event which is based in some form on scripture and earthed in a particular cultural context. It occurs usually, though not necessarily, in a liturgical setting, actively involving the hearer as well as the speaker. We might want to underline that, those of us who are wedded to the monologue sermon. And is created in the hope of joining in with the narrative of transformative encounter between the divine, the gathered congregation, the individual, and the wider community. It took me a long time to formulate that definition. <laughs> and I've written it down for you because it's quite dense, but I think it kind of catches all angles. It's deliberately broad because, in my opinion, and you might want to shoot me down, and that's fine, but this is my opinion, preaching can take many forms, which would include and go beyond our usual understanding of the traditional monologue sermon. Now, many people have questioned the place of preaching in the 21st century. Two books worth having a look at, and I've given you a bibliography in the handout. It's um, a little read, but worth investing in, is Johnny Baker's Grove booklet, Transforming Preaching, Communicating God's Word in a Postmodern World. He has a lovely expression. He asks us whether it's time to, and I quote, slay the sacred cow of preaching. It's provocative reading, but sometimes it's good to be provoked because it, it helps you to see where your boundaries are. Doug Paget's written a book, Preaching um, Reimagined. I have to say I don't like the book, but I, I'm engaged with it. He, he is very opposed to what he calls speeching. He says that the monologue sermon, speeching, uh, is top-down, authoritarian, and one way. I don't I have to say I don't necessarily agree with him there, but and he calls for what he, he says it's progressional dialogue. I didn't like that phrase because I think that's a very posh way of saying interactive and conversational preaching, which I don't think is anything new. Let me put my cards on the table. I am not at all convinced that the day of the monologue sermon is over. But I am utterly convinced that the day of dull, inspiring, top-down claptrap needs ousting, particularly if it's me that's delivering it. <laughs> I think there is a place for authoritative monologue preaching, but that is not the same as authoritarian. Um, and this kind of preaching, I think, seeks in God's grace to challenge, comfort and transform through the medium of carefully crafted words and performance, which I don't think is a swear word in preaching, grounded in theological engagement with scripture rooted in a particular context at a particular time. But I don't think that we only have to have monologue preaching. I think it's a tool in the, the preacher's toolbox. But there are other ways of doing it, round table discussion in a cafe style church. I think that could be a form of preaching. Um, I think you can include music and poetry and drama in preaching. 
You might want to use digital platforms. It might occur in a liturgical context and it might not. It seems to me that the house of preaching has many rooms, which leads me to this question, what then is holding the house of preaching up? So I ask myself, are there identifiable, for the want of a better expression, pillars of preaching, which remain constant even if the shape of the sermon changes? What supports the house of preaching regardless of sermon style? Now I think there are constants which can give us a real sense of security, a real sense of purpose in our preaching. And when you're secure, you're free to push the boundaries. When you, when you know the house isn't going to collapse, we can then be perhaps more creative about what we understand the sermon to be and maybe less defensive about new ideas. So, what might we regard as the pillars of preaching? I've thought about this for a long time and I want to just outline these. I'm not, this isn't the last word, it's the first word. Okay, and I, I, this is about, these are for me what supports the house of preaching. Yours might be different. We might want to have a debate about, around that. Maybe I've missed something off that's really important. First one, script, well, I've got scripture, purpose, revelation, imagination, and engagement. And I want to just unpack those with you fairly quickly. The first one, scripture. It seems to me that there must always be a relationship between scripture and preaching. The written word, shaping, the spoken word, whatever that might look like, helping us to discern the presence of the living word and the living word's call to us as individuals and communities. So it seems to me whether the sermon is a three-pointer, a roundtable conversation in a cafe church, a monologue sermon that perhaps seeks to weave interactivity um, throughout, maybe it's a story, a poem, a piece of drama, it has to have connection to scripture. I'm not going to move on that. That's my first, I'm going to be very stubborn about that. That's my first pillar of preaching. And you might want to say, but Kate, that's really dogmatic. You know, that, what do you mean by that? It seems to me clear that the preacher's primary text is always going to be the Bible because it's the scriptural revelation that constitutes the life of the church. Karl Barth says, you know, we can no more liberate ourselves from the Bible than, than a child can liberate himself from his father or herself. And I want to put mother in as well, but I'm just a bit awkward there. But you get the point. And I don't think that the relationship between scripture and the preacher is straightforward. I'm not, I'm not suggesting a very na naive kind of link, leap from one to the other. When I come to the scriptures, I come like pig pen. I come with all the accretions of my background, my education, my color, my ethnicity, my gender my mood in the given moment. So I might want to say to you, let's give the first voice to scripture, but that's naive, because I've already got lots of other voices. And it seems to me that it's in the wrestling match that the preacher goes through, that the nudge of God begins to come through. And that's why you've got a picture of Jacob wrestling with the angel, which seems to me to be a good uh, visual of what it is like sometimes to prepare a sermon. And that seems to me to be really important. So I'm not suggesting a straightforward move from scripture to preaching. After all, in Judges 4, a woman hammers a tent peg through some bloke's head, and we don't go, well, there's a model of conflict resolution. <laughs> it's a bit more complicated than that. So we need to respect, engage, wrestle, strive, listen, and learn from the scriptural canon. And I think Jesus points the way to us here, because he does that with his own scriptural canon, his own inheritance. In the Sermon on the Mount, he's very clear. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. No, I haven't come to abolish, but to fulfill. I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law till all is accomplished. But he also says, you've heard it say, said, but I say to you. So in his ministry, deep reverence for what he's inherited in terms of scripture, but he also pushes it. And I think there's a, a tremendous model there. Um, so that's my first pillar, scripture. What status do the scriptures have for preaching? One, I think they're normative. We preach from scripture, or if not directly, scripture is behind the sermon. And the scriptures guide our own thinking in relation to the 
purpose of preaching, and we'll come back to that in a moment. My second pillar is purpose. <coughs> really interesting question. I've done lots of days like this, and I've done lots of work with um, ordinands in training, and sometimes you ask the question, so why do you preach? Oh, right. Blank. What do you think you're doing? I've never really thought about that. Um, as preachers, I think we need to be able to articulate whatever the sermon looks like at the end. I'm not bothered about that. What I'm bothered about is that we need to be able to articulate what we understand the purpose to be. It matters. Donald Coggan, in a, a lovely book, Stewards of Grace, old book now, but he's absolutely right. The ineffectiveness of many sermons is due to the fact that preachers haven't wrestled with the fundamental question, what is preaching? And Fred Craddock, in his textbook on preaching, says, it's a theology of preaching which will nourish and sustain, he's talking about the pulpit, I want to be a bit broader than that, and say the preacher, however they're going about the preaching task, with a constancy that survives that ebb and flow of feeling. <coughs> you know what it's like as a preacher. You can be affected by your emotions, by tiredness, by disillusionment. And what do we hold on to? You pour yourself into whatever the sermon is, and it's really easy to feel disconnected afterwards. And all of us, I'm sure, in this room can identify with um, the difficulty of dealing with congregational response, either huge accolade or just a, blind, a sort of bland, bland kind of nice sermon. Um, why do you preach? Why do you preach? I put in here paired discussion, but I'm going to press us on because I want to get through a lot. But I do want to throw the question out. I ask you to consider for a moment, well, why did Jesus preach? One, if you look at his, his teaching, there's, a, there's a, a theme of reconciliation there, drawing people to God, a theme of challenging. He challenges the assumptions people make about God's character. For example, in the prodigal son or the laborers in the vineyard, he challenges judgmental attitudes. He urges a readiness. There's an ethical thrust in his teaching, challenging attitudes to money and idolatry. And he teaches about a new perspective, about the kingdom, about the pearl of, new, uh, the pearl of great price. Why do you preach? What are you trying to do? That's really important in any age. So we might come up with lots of creative ideas by the end of today about how we preach in the 21st century. But the how is re related directly to the why. What are you trying to achieve? What do you think you're doing? Revelation, my third pillar. Relating to the character of God. Why do I preach? I preach largely because I believe God is a God who communicates with people. The scriptures can be read as a record of God's dealings with his people, reaching out to communicate in word, in symbol, through people, through the young, through the old, through the prophets, John the Baptist, St. Paul, Mary Magdalene, and of course, ultimately, in the incarnation. God reveals God's self in many, many ways. And it's my contention that the sermon, in all the potential forms it might have, is a nodal point for God's revelation to us. And I want to go further and say I think that the sermon is laden with sacramental potential. What do I mean by that? It is potentially the place of the aha moment. The place where now I see it, now I get it. There is an inventiveness about the sermon. It is for this moment, for now. Even, and you'll know this. Even if you repeat a sermon, say take a straightforward monologue sermon, you preach it at the 8 o'clock, you preach it at the 10.30, it's not the same sermon. Even if you're working with a really tight script, there's an inventiveness about it. I want to say that in the sermon, however it looks at the end, I think what, what happens is the word is taken, broken, blessed and given. I think it's laden with sacramental potential. Whether it's done by one person or by a team of people, I want to say around this theme of revelation, that the sermon should surely reflect something of the infinite creativity of God. Why should every sermon look the same? I don't think it should. There's an artistry about preaching which echoes the artistry of the creator. And don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking a, a traditional three-pointer. That's great. I'm not knocking that at all. But I am saying that there are lots of other ways of cutting and shaping the sermon. And in terms of the argument for preaching to be seen in a wide range of forms, 
there is inspiration if you just look, it just cast your mind briefly into the scriptures, into the way Jesus preached. Was every one of them the same? Not at all. He used parables, aphorisms, images, pictures. He drew from the scriptures as he would have had them. He preached through his actions and ultimately through his life, death and resurrection. Which brings me to my fourth pillar of preaching. Imagination. I remain, I've been convinced for a long time, I've thought about it and read a lot and written a lot about it, and I remain utterly convinced that imagination is inherently important in the life of faith. And thus, it is inherently important in the communication and development of that faith. So imagination definitely made the cut and is on my list as a pillar of preaching. I'll talk a bit more about, about imagination in the life of faith, but just hold that for a moment. I think the imaginative preacher in the monologue format, take that as an example, will have a real care for words, for language, for imagery, a real thought about the effectiveness of performative gesture. How is the word inhabited in the body? An imaginative preacher will have thought about the perspective of the hearer, will have sat where they are and wondered how this sermon material plays out. An imaginative preacher will say, well, is this shape of sermon the best way to communicate what I'm, what I'm trying to say, or do I need to do it differently? Imaginative preachers will take risks, and they'll get it wrong and fall flat. They'll try new methods. I think the imaginative preacher will be much more willing to include the hearer in preparation, and maybe also in delivery using the skills and gifts of others around them. And I also want to say that if a sermon captivates the hearer's imagination and enables them to dream kingdom possibilities, which challenge the dominant narratives of the age, this is all straight from Walter Brueggemann if you want to follow any of it up, um, then I think we've got the potential for powerful transformative preaching. This is the one pillar that I think I need to perhaps take apart with you and expose some of the brickwork. Because I think you could go away going, imaginative preaching, well, isn't that all about fantasy and made up stuff? This is preaching, we don't want any of this rubbish over here. But let me just defend my argument for a moment or two. If I can find the right page of my notes. First of all, you could turn around to me and you could say, ah, oh, Kate, you know, banging on about imagination, but go to the scriptures. You're the one who said scripture was really important, and the scriptures present a very mixed picture around imagination. There's no single word in scripture for what we would understand as imagination. And mostly, when the scriptures refer to the heart, to the cardia, or, or in the Hebrew, lev, it's because it's in need of transformation. So aren't you on dangerous ground? Well, perhaps so. But just listen to this, and where I read the word heart, put the word imagination in. I'm in Ezekiel 36. A new heart I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. When I read that and I think about God transforming the imagination of the human heart, it, the lights go on for me. Surely preaching is about transforming the way people see the world, helping people to frame the world in a different kind of way, a way that's congruent with the kingdom. I think, although in terms of etymology, in terms of language, the scriptures don't present that clear and straightforward a picture, if we just broaden it a bit and say, well, what about the biblical form? Ah, the genre of the Bible is just breathtaking in scope. If that isn't an argument for saying, when you communicate the faith, why are you only communicating it in this way? Well, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what, you know, it seems to me to be just a no-brainer. I think there's a mandate here for the use of imagination in relation to sermonic form and language. So if you've come here today, and we will all have an idea of what a sermon looks like, won't we? And it, it, you might be that you think, well, a sermon, you run, you run the scripture and comment and have illustrations. Maybe that's a sermon. Or you might think, well, no, I, I'll draw it out and I'll have three points. Maybe that's a sermon. Or maybe you think, I'll write, a, I'll write a story that runs with the flow. Maybe that's a sermon. Maybe I'll have a series of, of monologues that are broken up with music. Maybe that's a sermon. <coughs> Keeping pushing it. What about use of digital media? 
in preaching? How can we bring that in? And, and would that work with your people? It might for some, it might not for others. But I just want us on the basis of the scriptural revelation to say, can we push the boundaries back and be more creative? David Kelsey, in the uses of scripture in recent thought, comments that how we construe, construe scripture affects the way we use it. In other words, how we see scripture, how we frame it, how we ooh, imagine it. So if you see scripture as a fixed deposit, a kind of repository that we go and get stuff out of, well, you're likely to preach deductive propositional sermons that make doctrinal points. Perhaps, though, if you see the scriptures as a conversation partner, a source of security and a, and a place of struggle, maybe we are more open to being shaped by it and shaping our thoughts in dynamic, creative response. So there's a question for you to consider. How do you construe scripture? The second thing I want to say is that I would want, I contend that the imagination is central to theology. It's vital to theology. And because I'm never quite secure without a good quotation behind me, this is Trevor Hart in Imagining Evangelical Theology. He says this, might we actually suppose imagination itself to be a vital tool and resource for the grasp and elucidation of the substance of theology, enabling us in certain circumstances at least to go further and to see much more than other discursive modes of theological reflection. I just want to applaud that. Might we actually suppose imagination itself to be a vital tool in theology? I want to go, yes, we might. However, there may be a number of reasons why Hart's proposal might want to, you might want to resist it, because the imagination is clearly linked to fa fantasy, idolatry, deceit, delusion, and evil. It might not appear too congenial to the theologian. A little quote from Paradise Lost, where Milton describes Satan in these terms. Squat like a toad, close at the ear of Eve, assaying by his devilish art to reach the origins of her fancy, and with them forge illusions as he list phantasms and dreams. But I still want to say, well, yeah, okay, Milton, fine. I doff my hat to you, that's great poetry. But I want to defend imagination on the grounds that like any other aspect of humanity, it can be employed to positive or negative ends. So temptation can come in the shape of images and inner narratives, but resistance can also be mediated by the same means. That the imagination can be abused is no reason to oust it from the theological arena. Eva Brand sees imagination operating in Christianity in four ways. Narrative. She says the stories of faith need absorption and visualization. Metaphor. The way that we handle the figurative language of scripture is imaginative. Visionary, the insight of the seer is essentially imaginative. And she says, imagination is used in the cognitive mode in theology, shaping our use of analogy. And I would want to add to that the role of imagination in memory and, to, and, intis, and, and anticipation, which is so important in the life of faith. Garrett Green, in his book on um, theology and imagination, he, oh, what's it called, Imagining God was his book, he sees the um, imagination as the human point of contact in the act of revelation, which is not to say that the imagination is somehow um, not as fallen as the rest of us, but he would say it's just part of our humanity where God connects with us and speaks to us. And you know when you listen to a piece of music and you, your heart sings and you lift it up, or you stand on mountain top and, and look out, the lights go on, the connection, or you look into the eyes of a small child and the... Ch he would say that is about the revelation of God speaking into and interacting with our imagination. And I think he's on to something. Sandra Levy, in a lovely book, Imagination and the Journey of Faith, asserts this, it's the imaginative power, the God-given way by which humans are hardwired, that provides the locus for transcendent revelatory truth to be revealed. Now, I just want to hold that in tension with some of the sermons I've preached, I'll be honest, and a few of the sermons I've heard. Imagination, lifted, eyes opened, oh, the aha moment, and then sometimes 
some of the preaching that goes on in our churches that just suggests that sometimes those two things are quite a long way away from each other. And I want to say to us as preachers, how have we let this happen? How have we let it be that the most fantastic, um, I want to say unimaginably wonderful, because it, is, it stretches your imagination to st the gospel, how have we sometimes just boiled it down to dead words? How's that, how did that happen? And how are we going to make sure we stop that and we challenge one another and we're honest? And that we inspire people who maybe have never heard the gospel at all. How do we connect with them? That's what today is about. How are we going to do this? Just still on the subject of imagination, um, I just want to take um, a quotation from John McIntyre where he describes the incarnation as an expression of the daring imaginativeness of God. Which I think is an, um, a wonderful quotation. The daring imaginativeness of God. And Hans Urs von Balthasar, in, um, in the first book of his many works, I'd like to be able to say I've read them all, I only read the first book. I'm sure there's riches in the rest of them, but he wrote a lot. Um, he focuses on the divine beauty expressed in Christ and says it's the very apex and archetype of the beauty in the world, a recognition of which, he says, is an act of seeing with the eyes of the spirit. Just working on from that, let's push this, am I going too far? I don't know, but let's just push it a bit further. Could we say that imagination is a divine attribute? Because if I can claim that, then I have no worries about saying it's central to preaching. Well, let's just think of a few things. Redemption. Is that not an enterprise in imagination? In perfect freedom, God begins a new thing. Imagining new possibilities for the recipient of divine love and desiring their transformation. Is God's love going out of God and seeking the other contiguous with imagination? Is God's imminent presence entering the condition of the sinner in understanding and in sympathy and imaginative activity. Mercy, in the perfection of mercy, do we see the divine imagination at work as God enters into the distress of the other with a desire to heal and transform. It seems to me that imagination is about possibility. So is the kingdom of God in itself about imagination, about dreaming new possibilities in the light of God's transforming power? What about creation? I know there's flaws in this argument, and you'll say, well, what about you know, all the terrible things that happen in creation that seem to reveal an absence of God? And I want to hold that intention, but also to say, doesn't the creation for all its flaws mediate something of the other? Is creation <coughs> at its finest an artwork which reflects something of the artist? And if imagination is a divine attribute, is it also a divine gift? to us. Could we see imagination as being part of, the, of being made in the image of God? How do we interpret that Genesis reference to humanity being made in the image and likeness of God? Well, it's certainly about relationship, and I would want to argue that relationship, human and divine, requires imagination, whether that's in prayer, scriptural reflection, or in patience, forgiveness, seeing the other from seeing the situation of the other from their point of view, it seems to me that relationship is essentially imaginative, requiring <coughs> exercise of imagination. What about dominion? We are given, dim so I don't like the word, but we are given dominion over the earth, which I would interpret as the task of caring for the earth rather than dominating it. Dominion in family life, or farming, or mending a car, or managing a business. In all of these things, do we not need to exercise imagination? What if I just undid that nut and moved that round to there and tried again with this? What would happen? But in my case, the wheels of the car would fall off. But what if, in the next year, we set the projections for the business as this, this, and this, cut, the, cut our cloth here? I wonder if, in a year, isn't that an exercise of imagination? Isn't that about exercising care <coughs> for, for the world? And finally, we're tasked in Genesis with the task of reproduction, whether that's in the sense of um, creation of new life or whether 
a broader interpretation. Either way, it would seem to me that reproduction is an inherently imaginative act, bringing into being that which is not. So, I think on the basis of that, I want to say imagination is a key element in theology and is inherently important in the life of faith and therefore is inescapably important in the articulation of an invitation to that life. Hence, I think it's a key pillar in preaching. That was a hard one. Um, and my final, I'm sorry, I'm racing through this, but I want to throw it back to give you some time to come back to me. So I'll stop in a moment, but engagement, I think, it's my fifth pillar of preaching. What do I mean by that? Obvious. Preaching needs to connect. If it fails to connect, then perhaps Johnny Baker is right, and it is time to slay the sacred cow of preaching. If it doesn't connect, it's a waste of time. Why, why are we bothering? We're wasting our time, we're wasting other people's time. Go home if it doesn't connect. People need to engage, but how do we know if people are engaged? And this is a really relevant question to those of us who are perhaps more wedded, note the us, by the way, perhaps more wedded to the monologue sermon. How do we know we've connected? Do we ever talk to people about their experience of preaching? Have we ever had that conversation with our churches? Why do we have preaching? Do you look forward to preaching? Do you switch off in preaching? What are you doing when a sermon is happening in the traditional monologue mode? Do we have any idea of the ordinary theology of our people? Ordinary theology isn't my phrase, it's Jeff Astley's phrase. He's an academic in the university. And by ordinary theology, he's not being disparaging at all. He uses the term to, um, uh, uh, as opposed to academic theology, ordinary theology. Ordinary theology is lived theology. But do we as preachers have any idea of the ordinary theology of our people? In the traditional way that preaching is taught, you know, you're taught to make sure you exegete the scriptures. It's really, really important to understand the scriptures. Those of you who've been trained in preaching, did anybody ever talk to you about exegeting the congregation? Did anybody ever give you any of the skills to do that? Incidentally, if you want to know how to exegete the congregation, there's a book by Nora Tubbs Tisdale. It's on your handout. It's great. And she gives you loads. She's um, coming from the North American context. But she talks about the culture shock of preaching. And she compares. I'm going off script now, but this is good. Um, she compares. Uh, she, basically, she was, she's, been, she's come out of a quite highly educated, and she goes off to her new um, congregation, and she preaches, and she does all the stuff she's always done, and nothing happens. They just glazed. Nothing. So she calls it the culture shock of preaching. It just doesn't connect. And she was really blown to bits by this, because in, in a context where the people were all like her, it did. So she writes this book um, called Preaching as Local Theology and Folk Art, and it, it really helps you with how do you read your congregation. Um, and I, I commend it to you, it's highly readable. So your congregation, what do they think about God? Is there a predominant model of God in your congregation? What is their understanding of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Do people in your congregation, when they speak of Jesus, do they call him Jesus or do they call him Christ? Or do they not really mention him at all? No judgment here, I'm just, you know. Are your people, are you in a church of the Father? We have God the Father and that God our Father and that's fine, but we don't talk about anything else. Are you in a church where the Holy Spirit gets, gets a word in edgeways? Or is the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost that only happens at eight o'clock? <laughs> Why do your people come to church? What, what is their discipleship story? Because it doesn't matter what the sermon looks like. You know, it might be a fantastic piece of drama. It might be a, I don't know, a digital performance on multiple, multiple platform, whatever. If, if, it's, if it's not connecting with where your people are coming from, it, it doesn't engage. It seems to me that preaching is the work of the whole church. Go back to your congregations and say that. Guys, preaching is the work of the whole church. And they might come back and go, well, why are we never involved in it then? Uh, why do you never talk to us about it? Even if it looks like the work of one person, genuine preaching, I want to argue, only happens, and I'm, I'm in the monologue mode at the minute, but it only happens when the hearer is open to the sermon and listening for God. 
In the theatre, the fourth wall of the theatre is the congregation. Is the congregation? Is the um, the audience? Thank you. Um, so, if we were watching the RSC doing a performance of Hamlet, and the actual performance is not based solely on them, it's on us. We make the performance. We bring our stuff to it. So every time the RSC does Hamlet, it's different. It's exactly the same in preaching. It seems to me that what happens in effective monologue preaching, which might be true of other forms of preaching as well, is that one main sermon text is preached, but many sermons are heard. I think that's really important. As the Spirit takes the words of the sermon and weaves them into whatever's going on in the lives of the hearers and in the life of the whole community. And maybe that goes some way to explaining that really strange phenomenon that sometimes happens at the church door. When someone comes up to you and says, when you said X, that was really great and I really thought about Y. And you sit there thinking, hmm, do I tell them that I never said X? Or do I just smile and claim it? Um, and I always have a full text, even if I don't use it, I have a full text for my sermon, so I know I didn't say X. Uh, what's going on there? <coughs> That's not the sermon I preached, but it's the sermon you heard. Uh, I think that's what preaching is about. In some of our church traditions, preaching has been about the communication of ideas, so that I tell you something, and it's a good sermon if you remember. So if you know exactly the history of the Jebusites, wait, well, hey, it was a good sermon. Um, not so. So if I'm preaching a sermon and at the end of it, Mrs. Jones comes out and says, well, now I know the distance between Jerusalem and Bethany, that's not a great sermon, is it? But if she goes away thinking, um, look how Jesus wept over the death of Lazarus. Does he understand how I feel about Fred's death? Does God know about grief and loneliness? Can I be angry with God like Mary seemed to be? Will I be understood? Mrs. Jones is really engaged, and my hope and prayer would be that those questions would go on in the life of the sermon that she weaved with God, by the grace of God through whatever stuff I had constructed, would go off into the week and shape her. I have a high view of preaching, as you will gather. Um, I think effective preaching in any form can operate a little bit like spiritual direction. It provides material for reflection as the life experience of the hearer encounters the body of the sermon. I want to draw us into land. Um, I've talked at you fairly intensely for a enough time, but these are my pillars of preaching. Scripture, purpose, revelation with incarnation sitting underneath that, imagination and engagement. And you will have heard me often make reference to the monologue sermon because I think there is, I still want to champion the place of that in preaching. But I also want to say, let's push it. Let's see what other things we can do. And I still think it's preaching. But whatever form, what I think we need to be doing, as those who handle the word and help others to handle the word, is not to do to people, not to dump on people, but to walk with people. I'm going to stop there. I've got five minutes before the end of this session, and, and, and I've given you a lot of, I think this, I think that. And you might want to lock and load and come back at me and say, well, I don't know. We'll push this a bit further, or what about this, or have you thought about that? And today's, hopefully, is about throwing ideas around, so do feel free. And also, anybody who's um, watching online, and if you're from Amazon, don't sue me. Uh, <laughs> Hannah's got a microphone, so if you, if you do want to ask a question, do use a mic. It just makes it easier for people listening in. So, is anybody? Probably. Yes, oh, probably. Thanks. I hadn't thought of imagination the way you describe it, and it's kind of an aha moment, really. Oh, uh, brilliant. Following it up, which author would you recommend for starters? I think Sandra Levy, Imagination and the Journey of Faith, would, would be a place I might probably start. There's also um, a chapter by Walter Brueggemann in um, a reader on preaching, which is by Jeff Astley, David Day, and somebody else, but I can't remember. And it's called Preaching the Imaginative Awe. 
O-R, not O-A-R. He's <laughs> just like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that would be imaginative. Um, and it, he talks about, uh, Brueggemann talks about, effect he's effectively talking about the prophetic imagination. And he's saying that um, one of the things preaching needs to do is to present an alternative narrative to the dominant ideology of the age. Uh, he's, it's very much, he's railing against um, the, the culture in America. Uh, he, he would kind of call it the Coca-Cola culture and say that there are other ways of looking at the world. Um, so I would say that essay is really good and Sandra Levy's The Journey of Faith, uh, Imagination in the Journey of Faith would be the books I'd recommend. Hannah. Sorry, I'm trying to think. Okay, I've just been reading um, Eugene Peterson's memoir, The Pastor. Oh, and yeah. he, he talks about developing a pastoral imagination. And I've, been, I've been kind of struggling with what that means. And I, and I think he's talking about something really big. He's saying, imagine your whole life and your congregation in the context of, of grace and mercy and so on. And I'm, I'm finding that really helpful thinking about preaching as well, to say it's not, it's not just about kind of thinking up some clever <coughs> ways of communicating. It's yeah. saying about imagine things differently, see things differently. Absolutely. I think one of the difficulties when we talk about imagination is that people have a tendency to think, and it's usually based in something that some unthinking teacher said in primary school, you know, oh, well, I, I don't have an imagination, I, I, I don't know how to, you know, I'm not imaginative. And that closes down the discussion. And I think that's because people, we need a much broader understanding. So in a bit of writing that I did recently, I, I drew up a framework of imagination whereby I wanted to say, I think there is such a thing as the sensory imagination, which I think is um, about, it's, it's artistic, it's about kind of how you, uh, how, you know, how you interact with the world through all of your senses and how you perceive the world. I also think there's a thing called the, I've got it in my mind, so I'm waving my hands around, um, sensory imagination, the uh, intuitive imagination, that capacity to see patterns, make licks, and as preachers, you, you'll know what it's like. You've, you've worked on something for three days and it's just, a heap of rolled up paper in the, uh, I can't see how they, and then you sleep on it and bang. That links with that, that goes to there, that, I would say that's kind of intuitive imagination. What I think you're talking about is what I call it empathetic imagination, which is exactly that, the ability to stand in another person's shoes, to say how does it, how does it feel to be unemployed on Teesside and your marriage is falling apart? What's that like? How can I help you to re-envisage your life so that there is hope? How do we see God? in this mess where God seems to be most absent. Is that the kind of thing that you're... I think it's included in it, but I think, I bigger think still. maybe it's bigger than that. It's about what if God's like this? And uh, then, yeah, I would... Uh, uh, and yeah. that's kind of a, that's a whole life thing, isn't it, really? Yeah, I, I call that the intellectual imagination, which is the capacity to ask, um, to, to, to enter into supposition and hypothesis. If this, then what? Um, so if God is, what difference does that make if you're unemployed on Teesside? Uh, what does difference does it make for that whole area if the kingdom is? What does, the, what does the kingdom of God coming in this place look like? And how would we know? Uh, really helpful. So that was Eugene. I've not read the book. Eugene Peterson. It's his memoir called The Pastor. Well, I'll just write that down. Um, I'm going to have to come into land. There's probably time for one more question. Uh, yes. Eugene Peterson. Uh, well, I'd just like to say that it really resonated with me when you said about um, how have we made Jesus so boring? Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I felt that for such a long time. Um, you know, we, we had him drawing huge crowds. People just couldn't leave him alone. And now we anticipate that people are going to be sitting, be bored to death, and sit quietly. Um, and in a, in a society which never stops. Yeah. So we are just so counter culture and so boring. And the thing that sort of sustained me over the past six years has been I've, bec I've become involved with Open the Book, going into um, primary schools and opening the Bible in an interactive way. And to, you know, t for those children to say, oh, as you walk through the door, oh, good, it's Open the Book today. It's such a different culture shock 
from going into church and people being prepared to sit and be bored together. So the question is then, <laughs> how? Because I think what you're doing is imaginative preaching in yes. the 21st century yes. with those kids. I think that's exactly that. How does that come back the other way? Yes. How can you use the excitement and energy of those children to reignite the excitement and energy of the children within the church? I think All we've got us. into a situation in the church where we we feel that adults have to be treated in a certain way. Oh, so, I wish I had more time. I'd so much like to talk to you about the theology of play. Yes. I think play is such a serious business. And why isn't there more laughter in church? And why can't preaching shake hands with stand-up comedy every now and then? Yes. You know? Why can't preaching be more like a jazz club? Why can't going to church be more like the experience of being in a jazz club? I want to go there, or a comedy club, I want to go there. So I want to applaud you. I've got to stop or Be Bex will kill me. Um, but let's keep the conversation going. And if anybody wants to pick up that conversation about theology of play and preaching, well, we've got break times, we've got lunch time, and we can do that. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Bex Lewis. You're very kind.